Is it clear to you what would happen if we do start to relax any of the current measures? Look, we don't know how many cases are out there in the community that are mild that could drive another spike in numbers. So I think that the Premier in um, that I've just listened to from New South Wales and Victoria are very sensible in trying to encourage us to continue to do what we've been asked to do. Because um, while the numbers looked as if most of the cases were coming from overseas travellers, and they were, we still have a significant but small proportion that could be within the community. And if we start loosening up our social distancing, those numbers could increase. So we just have to cope with the idea that life isn't normal for a little while longer. Professor, there is an argument that we should start lifting some restrictions with the aim of exposing healthy Australians to the virus to lift immunity rates. Is that a smart strategy in your view? Mm. Look, that's a very dangerous strategy. I can understand it looks appealing. Um, certainly, uh, the experts, one of the experts from Hong Kong who uh, initially identified the SARS-CoV-1 virus, uh, reminds us that we could have uh, immunity for quite some time, at least a year after this virus, and that plasma or serum from um, people who've recovered are using it, they're using it in America now, they've got FDA approval to use that as a therapy for people who are, are very sick. Um, but to expose people to the virus deliberately to think that we'll get some herd immunity may be placing people at um, you know, a very serious illness for them because you can never work out who's going to get severe illness and who's We look like we have just uh, lost that feed. We're obviously doing a lot of Skype interviews here at Sky News as we practice our social distancing measures. And it uh, looks like we've had some technical gremlins with uh, that interview there, which is a shame because it is fascinating, of course, to hear from professors uh, like that who really are really at the front line of giving advice to our governments as to what sorts of measures are necessary at, that time, at this time. Let's just move on for now and turn to the UK. The British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, remains in hospital in critical care. There are problems arising within his government over who will make key decisions about the crisis. I'm on Sky at the moment. How's the Prime Minister? Uh, in very good hands. Boris Johnson's stand-in arriving for work. The Prime Minister himself remains here, the intensive care unit of St Thomas's Hospital in Westminster. He's stable, breathing without a ventilator, but his condition's still serious enough to require round-the-clock medical care. The PM in good hands, but no one knows when he might return to this lectern. His absence not just a strain on the machinery of government, but on the people in it too. He's not just the Prime Minister, for all of us in Cabinet, he's not just our boss. He's also a colleague and he's also our friend. So all of our thoughts and prayers are with the Prime Minister at this time, with Carrie and with his whole family. And I'm confident he'll pull through. Because if there's one thing I know about this Prime Minister, he's a fighter. But still questions too about how we ended up in this situation. The Prime Minister is in intensive care. The Health Secretary caught the virus. How was that allowed to happen? We all know that this is an extremely easy virus to pass on. That is exactly why the lockdown uh, was necessary. That was why the very large number of things that we've had to ask people to do and not do uh, are in place. In Downing Street today, people passing on good wishes to the PM and his fiance. Goodwill from the palace too, tweeting. Earlier today, the Queen sent a message to Carrie Simmons and to the Johnson family. Her Majesty said they were in her thoughts and that she wished the Prime Minister a full and speedy recovery. Beth Rigby, Sky News, Westminster. And we can now return to Professor of Epidemiology, Mary Louise Laws. Apologies for the technical gremlins there. Good to see you back. You were just discussing some of the ideas that have been floated around. And it, look, it does seem at the moment that everybody is uh, an armchair expert, but you're the real expert. So you were just discussing there this concept of herd immunity. Um, how far is off from that is Australia? Yeah. I mean, it seems like yeah. we would be very far off from achieving that anyway. Yes. 
Look, I was just about to say when we dropped out and uh, the story of Boris Johnson came on, I was actually going to use him as an example uh, of the fact that there is a man that would appear to be uh, relatively young, not elderly, uh, in good health and is having uh, not a mild case. And so if we were to imagine that we would allow this virus to set free in the community, we don't know, we can't predict uh, who will get very sick or, or moderately or severely ill. Um, we, can, we do know that anybody with a mild uh, comorbidity uh, can get very sick. So it's something that our authorities don't want to chance. And I fully concur with them. It's too dangerous. But um, the scientists are doing some amazing work with treatment, with uh, people that have recovered to use their antibodies as treatment for people who may not be doing so well. Um, the virologists are developing vaccines. And even if this virus mutates slightly, um, they'll know how to accommodate that because we do it every year for flu. But Australians need to be uh, resolute that this will go on for a bit and we need to um, pull together and, um, you know, we're a strong group uh, to s stay at social distancing. Can I also include one more thing is that people talk about why can't we use masks and a lot of the masks that uh, they can buy over the counter may use the term N95, but they're not the same as hospital grade masks. And they actually don't offer a, um, a reliable amount of protection. It can be as low as 10%. So if you want to wear a mask, go right ahead. But remember, don't talk with the mask on because it could just be a, a paper mask of three layers. So still keep social distance, but don't speak with your mask on um, and, and, yeah, try to cope with the fact that the Easter holidays is going to be spent at home. Well, you're right. The debate over masks seems to have become quite a fierce one. Also, a, a hotly debated topic is the issue of schools. The Prime Minister and Chief Medical Officer keep telling us that from a medical perspective, children are fine to go to school. This is something that our leaders, and in particular state premiers and chief ministers, are grappling with at the moment as we head into Easter holidays and start to think about what Term 2 will look like. Essentially, they seem to be saying that more of the concern is focused on the teaching staff at a school. What's your view as to whether or not yes. schools should be going back to close to situation normal in Term 2? Yeah, look, it is in, it's a very difficult one because while we know that students, uh, young people, can get um, COVID-19, they don't seem to drive um, the, the epidemic at all. Uh, they're not some sort of hidden asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic group that drive it. We, we're pretty clear that we could rule that idea out, but they can get it, but not often. So the next group, if you are going to send the school children back to school, are the staff, and we need to protect them. So I would... Um, I would suggest that you'd have to bring back school slowly, uh, depending on um, the requirements of, say, high school students may need to go back first. Uh, I would ask the parents of school uh, students to still respect uh, social distancing. If you're dropping your children off and picking them up, do not wait around. Please keep your distance. It's not an opportunity to socialise because then you're putting the staff at risk because if you spread it to other adults or you know, other parents, it could easily get to, um, to students. So if the authorities are going to consider this, they'll probably have to stagger it for a while. And I know that's going to be difficult, but I think we're going to have to lower our expectations about what normal life looks for us for a few more months. And when we look at a time frame, I mean, there is the view that we need to keep taking these actions until a vaccine is found. And I know you mentioned the hunt for a vaccine earlier. Is there a risk, though, that we won't find a vaccine? I mean, there, there are hunts for a number of vaccines for a number of viruses that simply haven't been found. Are you confident that we will actually get one for this? There are 
countless number of uh, virologists around the world looking into this, including our Australian Doherty Institute and others up in Queensland. Um, and the China uh, shared um, the candidate virus very early on. Uh, it's not going to be easy because certainly uh, the vaccine that was initially um, trialed or developed for SARS uh, Cove one uh, was decided that it was very difficult and they were going to uh, shelve it because there weren't that many people they believed in the future would need it. Uh, so there's a possibility of bringing that back in and, and looking at whether they can improve that one. And I, I take your point, it, it, it's risky. Uh, and that's one reason why we don't want to lift social distancing yet because we don't have one ready for that first phase of trialing in a particular um, susceptible community such as the elderly. I mentioned there are plenty of armchair experts out there. I feel like we're also getting a crash course in uh, data analysis and modelling. We saw the modelling released by the federal government yesterday. It wasn't Australia specific. We've been told to expect more tailored modelling to come in the coming weeks. Why isn't the government in a position to release Australian specific modelling now? Surely that work is underway and, and has been underway in recent weeks. Um, look, models are only as good as the assumptions that the um, analysts put in. And the, the first models that were released uh, a day or so ago, of course, um, looked at what would happen if we closed the borders to Asian countries. And of course, um, in hindsight, it, uh, it was a f uh, not necessarily the most um, comprehensive uh, model because we know that people are um, great travellers from China and everywhere around the world. And of course, most of our cases were coming from Europe and America. Um, so they're probably going back to the model and tightening it up with a few more assumptions about how well we've done, particularly over the last um, week or nearly 10 days since we've had that border restricted with mandatory um, lockdown with travellers coming in. But before, we had some restrictions with the border, but they went to their hotel or home, and they may or may not have um, complied 100% with self-isolation. But given that we have that now, we will start to see the benefit. So I would suggest that they've gone back to the model to include that assumption about um, how well we're doing now. Professor Mary Louise McCaws from the University of New South Wales, appreciate you joining us to share your expertise with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure.